Uh, bah, 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 bah. So we left off with externalities, and I got one thing left to cover before we get into public goods. And I want to introduce you to Ronald Coase. Um, he had uh, a very innovative thing that won him the Nobel Prize in economics uh, back in the 50s, um, and which now come to be known as the Coase Theorem, in how to maybe address issues of externalities. And I want to just motivate this with an example. Suppose we've got a piece of land in which there is a farmer and a rancher. So the farmer and the rancher are next door neighbors. So the farmer, he's into making corn. Maybe it's wheat, I guess, since we're down in Kansas again, I keep forgetting. And then the rancher, of course, is into steers. There's our steer. Kind of a cross between a chicken and a steer. So anyway, that's our cattle. And What's kind of gone on over time is that there's this weird piece of land that abuts both of their properties that nobody's really ever claimed. And so a few generations ago, uh, Farmer, Farmer Dick's um, uh, relatives started planting it because it was just kind of sitting there, right? And so he started uh, planting it and about the same time, you know, they, they know each other pretty well. The rancher said, well, geez, I, I could use that land too. And so he would start to have his cattle uh, go on the land as well. And the problem is, is that every year the farmer would plant the crop and the cattle would go there and trample a fraction of the crop, sometimes more than others in different years, just depending on how much uh, cattle was going out there. And so there was kind of this waste uh, going on due to the trampling. So here's the problem in a nutshell. The problem is that there was this kind of unowned land, so unclaimed land where the farmer would plant and the rancher's cattle would roam, causing some fraction of the crop to be trampled. So from the big picture of life here, stepping back, looking at our island, it's kind of a waste, right? I mean, here we've got some crop being um, wasted. So we have wasted resources. Now in some sense, neither agent, the rancher or the farmer, really care. I mean, the farmer looks at it as, well, I get the land for free anyway, and uh, I know I'm going to get something out of it, so it's worthwhile for him to plant the crop, and of course it's worthwhile for the rancher to let his cattle roam on it. So the two parties don't really care, but from society's standpoint, there's kind of this waste going on. So something, you know, not working out right here in terms of the big picture of trying to efficiently use society's resources to their highest and best use. Okay, so um, one thing to do to kind of alleviate the problem uh, of this wasted uh, amount is to give the land to one or the other or split it up, right? So one thought is maybe if we need the government to come in and make a claim. So kind of enter the government here. Um, what if we establish 
property rights. And so maybe we can look at this and say, well, 50-50 seems fair. And now we just take that property and you know split it down the middle. But as we've learned in this class, what is fair is not always efficient, right? So can the government come into the marketplace and make an efficient allocation of the land? You know, is it is it better to have wheat or is it better to have meat? Ooh, that's kind of nice. I never did wheat before, so now I got a little rhyme going on. All right. You know, from society standpoint, should we have more wheat or should we have more meat? You know, does the government have to make it? You know, what's going to end up with the correct solution? So, <clears throat> although this seems fair, I think the bigger looming question is is this efficient? And that's what Robert, uh, Ronald Coase, was, was trying to tackle. Is this efficient? <clears throat> you know, and so what if, what if, uh, what if the farmer got 100% of it? All right, so if the farmer got 100% of it, um, what could he do? If he owned it all, how could, does that mean for sure that there'd be that much more wheat going on? What could he do? Yeah, he could charge it, he could rent it out, right? So look at what's kind of gone on in terms of economics. As soon as we've assigned property rights, there is an implicit opportunity cost to the farmer, right? So yes, he could plant it in wheat, but if he could make more money leasing it out to the rancher, he would do that, doing a cost-benefit analysis, right? So if wheat prices are down because people in the United States don't want wheat, they want meat, we started being more meat eaters, cattle prices start to rise. Can the rancher probably afford that rent now? Yes, right? You see how the, the market's going to figure itself out. But it won't figure itself out if there's not clearly defined property rights. So the moral of the story is that it actually doesn't matter who owns it from society standpoint, from the big picture standpoint. It actually doesn't matter if we give all of the land to the rancher, or all of the land to the farmer, or we do a 50-50 split. It really doesn't matter. As long as the property rights are well defined, we will get the most efficient allocation of wheat and meat for society. Now, it may not be fair to come in and say, well, we've both been using it for the last 100 years. How come the farmer gets it all? Right? That's a judgment call on fairness. But the powerful thing that Coase brought up is we don't have to worry about fairness. We don't have to have a big fight about it in the courtroom and be worried about, oh, am I doing the right thing for society? It doesn't matter. As long as property rights are well established, we'll get the most efficient allocation of wheat and meat in the market. All right, so here's what Coase put together. That doesn't always happen automatically. Um, we need a few more things for the market for the market to work out on its own. So the Coase theorem, in general, um, shows how private individuals without government, and I guess I want to say um, 
continual government involvement. You know, maybe it takes an act of the court or the government to do this allocation or somehow. So maybe it's a one and done. But from here to perpetuity, as long as we maintain those property rights, we're okay. So shows how <coughs> private individuals without government <coughs> can uh, create societies <coughs> most efficient uh, solution when faced with an externality. <clears throat> and so here's the requirements. There's three things required, three requirements for the private sector to be able to pull this off. Number one, we need well-defined property rights. Well-defined property rights. Everybody's got to own something. That's part of the reason we had issues with pollution was that nobody owns the air. We all kind of have equal rights to the air and so then no, nobody has to pay for it. So we need well-defined property rights. Number two, we need low transaction costs. So in our case of the farmer and the rancher, maybe these two good old boys can meet a, at the fence line and work things out with each other, right? The transaction cost of them coming from their house over to the fence line to hash things out is pretty low. It doesn't take a big process. We don't have to fly across the country to do it, right? And low transactions costs. And then finally, we need a small number of agents. If you guys have done group projects in class, whether it was high school or college, and the larger that group gets, the harder it is to come together with things, right? The harder it is to organize. And so these two, in this case where there's two agents, they can reasonably come to terms. But if we start to add more and more people, when I had the town of Crybaby with the pollution going down, creating the three eyes, if we have thousands of people there, it might not be easy to meet this requirement. But I will tell you from experience of the very many, too many, city council meetings that I sat in over the years doing my private real estate work, that too often um, there was solutions to the problem where if we just had better property rights, we didn't need the city government to get involved with the situation. Oh, we need to pass this, we need to subsidize this, we need to buy this, you know actions on the government to try to correct the problem. If we first thought about COAS and thought about, can we put this in the hands of somebody else and give them property rights to it so that they can call the shots, make their own decisions? We could have made it life a lot easier and would have had a less uh, intrusive uh, and possibly unfair uh, method of having things come together. Because even in city governments, they're often subject to what economists call crony capitalism. And that is getting favors from the government. This happens at all levels of government. Some governments are better than others, but some of them, the mayor of the town is a little too chummy with somebody else who ends up getting kind of special treatment, special favors. That's called crony capitalism, and that's not good for getting efficient solutions for society. Okay, questions or comments on that? So that is COS. So know those three things uh, for the exam. And the moral of the story is here that again, the agents will be able to negotiate out society's most efficient solution. Okay, but when they can't negotiate things out, we may fall into the next chapter's material. And this was kind of similar in a sense. The next chapter talks about public goods. So 
public goods don't work so hot in a marketplace, typically. Especially a pure private good, or a public good. A public good has two characteristics that define it. So first of all, jot this down. A public good is not a government provided good. Not a government provided good in econ class. It is in the real world. When we think about public goods, they're like, oh yeah, well, we got libraries, we got education, we got this and that. But in economics class, a public good is a very specific type of good that has two characteristics. So two characteristics. They are non-rival, non-rival, let me take them one at a time here. When we had our cheeseburger and beer from chapter three, those are called private goods instead of public goods because they are rival in consumption. Me eating the cheeseburger means you can't. So it's rival in consumption. So something that's non-rival means that the good can be consumed or enjoyed by more than one person without detracting from each other's enjoyment. So a good has a characteristic of non-rivalry if the good can be consumed or enjoyed by more than one person without each other's um, consumption detracting from the others. I don't like the way I worded that, but uh, let's put those parentheses. One person's enjoyment does not take away from another's. The other characteristic is that the good is non-excludable. McDonald's keeps us from eating their cheeseburger by keeping them behind a counter, and you give them money, they give you the food. Right? Have you ever noticed that at McDonald's, they typically don't give you the food first, you gotta get the money first. So that's kind of their gateway, right? So cheeseburgers are excludable. It's easy to keep people who don't pay for them from consuming them. So non-excludable means that it is impossible or cost prohibitive. Impossible or cost prohibitive to keep non-payers, people who don't pay, from consuming the good. Okay, so start thinking about any goods that might come to mind that multiple people can enjoy them at the same time and it's hard to keep non-payers from consuming them. What I want to do is create a four square box that's going to look like we're doing game theory, but we're not. It's just a little way to separate out things. And 
let's put the characteristic of excludable and non-excludable and rival and non-rival. So in this box are private goods that we've been talking about all semester. And it pertains to probably the vast majority of goods are private goods. So this is our cheeseburger. This is our beer. This is our haircut. So down in the lower right hand corner are public goods. The classic public good is national defense. Think about national defense. How is it non-rival? National defense. How is national defense non rival? So when, if we think about what's going on with national defense, it's that we're protected, right? We're protected from the bad guys, the terrorists, or whatever. We've got this nation uh, covered pretty well from that type of activity. So we can all enjoy that protection at exactly the same time. Me enjoying that protection does not take away from Hallie enjoying it, right? We can both perfectly enjoy it together my consumption of national defense does not take away from Halley's consumption whatsoever. In fact, we are all enjoying it right now, simultaneously, 100%, all together. All right, what about non-excludable? How does that work with national defense? What's that? You don't have to pay for it or? How do we pay for it? Taxes, but are we paying for it directly? So the flip side, kind of going back to coasts, if you want to think about what we just talked about with property rights, um, is it possible for us to construct something to where you would chip in for national defense? I mean, can, is that theoretically possible that we could have everybody pay for it? Yeah, we can all chip in for it, right? Now, we have to force people through taxation to pay for it. <clears throat> and the reason is, is that can we keep those people who don't pay for it from consuming it? Is that possible to do? No, right? So we can't, uh, Obama can't call up uh, the terrorists and say, listen, uh, McCullough didn't pay his taxes this year. You can bomb the heck out of him, but leave Hallie alone. Right? We can't isolate out the non-payers, so we're all going to enjoy it. So that's the distinction made here between non-excludable and non-rival. So national defense is a great one. A lighthouse is another classic example of a good, a lighthouse that's out on the ocean, for instance. The good that a lighthouse provides is light. It tells you where the shoreline is, right? And so you can imagine on our island here, we've got a lighthouse planted on Florida, and it is casting out a light to the ocean. Is it possible to exclude non-payers? No, it's just, you can see the light, anybody could be out there, right? So it's non-rival, there could be multiple ships out on the ocean enjoying it, and non-excludable. 
it is closer to a public good. Okay, now some of the interesting ones come in here on the corners. Think of a good that is excludable. In other words, we can keep non-payers out, but we can have more than one person enjoying it at the same time. I'll give you a hint, you're doing it right now. Education, right? There are close to 30 of you here today, all enjoying my lecture simultaneously. All right? Travis's consumption of it doesn't take away from Zach's consumption of it. So we have that non-rivalry in consumption, but it's excludable. Don't pay your bills, then we could send the Ottawa University police on you and I could say, hey, Caitlin keeps coming into class and she hasn't paid her bill, get her out of here. Right? So it's possible to exclude it. So what else is similar to that? Country club, good. So golf clubs. Uh, yeah, there's definitely some non-rivalry non non with that. Um, might have some excludability issues because you can pass it around for free. I mean, that's kind of a side issue, but um, movies, theme parks, all kinds of stuff actually that fall into this non-rivalry category. Um, what you run into though with these are possible congestion issues, unlike we did with national defense, which can have congestion issues, but they're so large it doesn't really matter. But we might run into some congestion issues, possibly. You know, the size of this classroom is only so big. We can't have the whole Ottawa University campus in here enjoying this lecture at the same time. We might have a little trouble with congestion. Now, down here, this one's probably the tougher box. Are there things that are rival, but yet non-excludable? We mentioned pollution before. What about air? Is that rival? Is air rival? In other words, is it possible for multiple people to enjoy the air? Or would it run out? If we put you in a closed cube, like one of those dollar, I saw one of the, my son went to the school carnival and they had the little thing where you grab dollars. Imagine if we make that airtight and put two of you in there. Would you learn something about the rivalry of air? Yeah, right? There's so much air around that we typically don't have to worry about it. But if you go to a place like LA, you might take a big, and we have some California guy, people in here, right? Uh, you take a big, breath of air, it might not taste quite the same as it does here in Kansas, right? So air isn't always free. In fact, pollution is an example of that. And when we suck in the air, do we blow out air? No, we do not blow out air. Remember, air is a special combination of stuff that I never really learned about because I was too busy with other fun topics. but. I know it's different. It has some oxygen and maybe some other stuff in the air. But when you blow it out, what do you blow out? Carbon dioxide. All right, so it's not the same, right? The air is rival and non-excludable. Um, so some other things uh, that might fall into this would be uh, wildlife. You know, if we think about going fishing, which I like to do, uh, there's only a certain amount of fish in that lake. If I catch the fish, you can't catch it. So the fish is actually a rival good, uh, but it might be hard to keep me off the lake if it's a big enough body of water. Or if we think about the ocean, uh, then especially is true. So ocean fishing. Uh, sunlight. These are some things that you guys maybe really didn't think about being goods. But remember when I told you economics is about everything? Well, economics is about everything. We look at all kinds of good. Air, fish, sunlight, national defense, being protected is a good. It kind of changes your frame of thinking on what is a good. It goes well beyond cheeseburgers and beer. It's all kinds of stuff that we consume. Okay, so there's our four square box. 
what is the key feature that allows the free market to pretty much work okay in getting us the quantities of these goods we desire? What is the characteristic now that gives us the ability for a marketplace to provide the good? What do we need in place for the free market to work? Look at that list. Look at the topics there, or look at the uh, various goods we've identified. Which one allows us to work without the middleman, possibly? That it's fine, fine and dandy just having buyers and sellers of it. What characteristic do we need? Rivalry, non-rivalry, excludability, or non-excludability? What does the good need to be for a market to work? Rivalry. So do these work in the market? So if we have to have rivalry, then that would exclude these from being out in the marketplace by private owners. We have private golf clubs, movie theaters, so these work, it's got to be excludable, right? So in order for a market to work, we got to be able to turn a profit on it. There has to be a price that you can charge. If we can't, if we don't have the ability to exclude non-payers, then the market system's not going to work. So we need this. Need this for the free market. And again, not totally free. We're not trying to say, you know, absolutely no government, but for the most part, agents acting on their own behalf, consumers trying to maximize happiness by the number of haircuts, beer and cheeseburger they buy, by the number of theme parks they visit, movies they go to, golf and education, by consumers doing what's best for themselves, producers trying to maximize profits, we get the market allocating these pretty darn good. Okay. Um, questions on that? Uh, the next thing I want to look at is the demand curve for public goods. We've run into some problems with the demand curve, and so this kind of helps illustrate why we may need the government to provide public goods like national defense, why things are going to fall apart. <clears throat> so when we had a private good, the market demand curve was the horizontal sum of individual demands. So do you remember we had three graphs side by side, and here was, you know, Tom, Tom and Dick, I guess we'll be missing Harry here. We'll say that there's just these two guys in the market. This will be enough for us to get the picture. And so we had a demand curve for Tom and a demand curve for Dick. Dick's demand was a little more elastic than Tom because we're all different. We have different preferences. And at a price of, uh, let me pick one down here, at a price of $7, Tom's going to buy five cheeseburgers. Dick's only going to buy three. And so in the market is the sum of all the individual demands. There's going to be eight units sold in the market. And of course there'd be thousands of Tom, Dick, and Harry's. We're just adding up their individual preferences of how much they'd like to buy at a market price of $7. All right, now, if price drops to 
Uh, five bucks. Tom ramps up his purchases to seven units. Dick ramps up his to seven units. And we end up getting 14 <coughs> units out in the market. So all I'm doing here is mapping out the relationship between individual demands and the market demand. And the market demand curve, we said, was the horizontal sum of individual demands. That was way back in chapter five, I think, five or six. Now, so this is big Q. So suppose now that we're thinking about Q being missiles instead of cheeseburgers. So what if Q equals the quantity of missiles demanded for national defense? the demand curve for society, the market demand curve, look like if we're thinking about missiles? Alright, so now if I come down here and I try to pick off one number, let me pick off seven. So go ahead and pick a seven here. The demand curve we learned is always <coughs> the marginal benefit. So the benefit of the fifth cheeseburger was seven bucks. The benefit of the fifth missile is seven bucks for Tom. And here, the same is true for Dick, and that's why we said that the market demand curve was the private benefits, which we now learned in the externality chapter. We assume that all of the people who are consuming the missiles represents then society's benefit. So the demand curve is equal to the private benefit curve as well as the social benefit curve if there's no externalities. So down here, what is the benefit of having seven missiles for society? What is the benefit of having seven missiles? The benefit in terms of dollars. What's the benefit of having seven missiles, not launched, just sitting there ready to zap the bad guys if they come? Right? So they're in their chamber with a red button ready for Obama to make the call and press the red button and boom, the missiles go. What is the estimated dollar value using my numbers of the benefit of having seven missiles? Thirty-five. How'd you get that? Five times seven, okay. So good. There would be, um, that would be the total dollars paid, right? So $35 there of money paid. But what is the benefit at the margin of the seventh missile? So you were right the way you, the way you said that in terms of the total value to one of them. What about the seventh missile? What's the benefit of the seventh missile to Tom? Five bucks, right? The height at seven, we go up to the marginal benefit curve, hang a left, it's five dollars. So there's five dollars worth of benefit to Tom for the seventh missile. What's Dick's benefit? Five. What's society's benefit? Is it five? 
On average, it's five. But what is society's benefit? It's greater. So again, let's walk through it. This is, this, is, this is the catch right here. So listen up tight. Tom's benefit is $5. Dick's benefit is $5. So if Tom and Dick are all the members of society, what is society's benefit of the set, having the seventh missile in the inventory? Ten. Why? Why could you do that? What characteristic? What are these missiles that allows you to add those two together? Missiles are non, which one is it, excludable or rival? What allowed you to add them? We have seven missiles sitting in the big silo, ready to go. Pointed at Afghanistan as we speak. Here's Afghanistan. Here's our beloved United States. It has not been launched yet. Tom's benefit is five bucks. Dick's benefit's five bucks. Ten dollars, non rival, right? They both are enjoying the protection simultaneously. Which means that the that's different than what was going on with the cheeseburger. Tom and Dick don't share that cheeseburger. They are rival in consumption. So when we look at the benefit to society of the last unit produced, it's the last one eaten. The benefit is the price of five, the horizontal sum. But now the benefit of the seventh one is not five, but 10. It's the vertical sum. The demand curve, the marginal social benefit curve, is the vertical sum of individual benefits, marginal benefits. The marginal social benefit curve is the sum due to non-rivalry. Great thing to know for the test. Due to non-rivalry of those missiles. So here's where the problem comes in. Um, if, if missiles, let's see, if, um, if the cost of missiles is $8, so the marginal cost of a missile, each missile runs eight bucks. The only way that we get missiles provided is by having these two groups work together. If there's Tom, Dick, and Harry, and there's thousands of others, neither one of these two gets enough benefit all by themselves to buy it, right? So at an individual level, if Tom and Dick don't know each other and they're not looking out for each other's self-interest, if they just are looking out for their own and they can't quite come together because there's a large number of agents, et cetera, et cetera, neither one's just going to buy it on their own because they're being rational. The cost of a missile's, missile is greater than their private benefit of five bucks, so they won't do it. The market doesn't work. It kind of falls apart in the production of public goods. and so. We can force their payment through taxes to cover more than cover the cost of missiles. In fact, we'd want a few more in our inventory. The efficient level of missiles for society is where the cost of the last missile, which, assuming that the missile company is not polluting, right, the social cost equals the private cost. So if the weapon company is not creating any externalities, this is the efficient level of missiles in our inventory for the United States where the marginal the cost the social cost of the last missile produced is equal to the social benefit of the last missile produced but that's not going to happen by having all individual agents acting on their own there has to be cooperative behavior and possibly you're going to have an exercise in your homework maybe that can happen under the right circumstances Okay, 
The last thing I want to look at is in your notes, if you have the, these sheets, or at least make a reference in your notes if you don't have them today, it's this, this picture. Um, There's a big question out there whether through a democratic system of voting do we get the efficient level of public goods? Does that get us the right result? And there's two theories that I want you to be aware of. One is social interest theory. And in short, the answer is yes, democratic system gets efficient results, efficient level of public goods. But then there's another theory called public choice theory. And they say no. No, because of a number of things. One is rational ignorance. So voters are not fully informed. So we don't take the time to learn about the cost of each proposal to make sure that the politician is deriving our ideal of, well, let's do something if the marginal social benefits exceeds the marginal social cost, do it. If not, don't. Well, I've got better things to do with my life. And my vote isn't going to count anyway. So I know MTV tells you guys that your vote counts, every vote counts, but in some respects, uh, it's just not true. I mean, you can argue the other way that, okay, there's 300 million people, there's a million people that vote, I'm just one vote out of many, you look at all the elections, how many elections come down to one vote? For your vote to really matter, you would have had to be the linchpin for it to change. But I'll tell you this, I'm not, I, I am definitely pro political process in other respects because the way you can sway the vote is to be active. Then you can make a difference. If you can get some of the other rationally ignorant people to come to your side because you believe in it and you believe in that policy and you tell them, hey, this is what I learned on this. If you're more active in the process, then you can matter. But from a theoretical point of just your vote, chances are you don't matter. And so that's a topic of um, rational ignorance. And when people are rationally ignorant, we might have a situation where if this is the quantity of the public good, if people don't care, there is always a politician or a special interest group that will want to keep increasing the level of the public good. In other words, they're going to continue to push and their argument is, well, there's benefit to society, see? We should have 100 units of this because here's the benefit. If there's not somebody to hold them accountable for what the costs are, then the efficient decision making is out the window, right? And so this is one of the arguments of why we tend to see too much public good. There tends to be an overproduction of it. So overproduction of public good. This is kind of under the public choice theory heading. So this is number two. Overproduction of the public good. They'll have a short little homework that goes over that as well. Okay, that is going to be our course, folks.